you know, I wanted to exp learn more about things. So I went and I actually found a book of or uh, Arizona history. It was for about a fourth grade level. I go, well, that's when you would teach state history and stuff. So, and other things and other resources. And then I started coming across these little funny little memes about, well, you know you live in Arizona when you think Taco Bell is the local phone company? Or this one, you know you live in Arizona when you notice your car overheating before you drive it? <laughs> now, most of these probably apply to Phoenix, Tucson, Mesa, you know, stuff like that. But uh, you also know you live in Arizona when you no longer associate bridges with rivers or water. How about this one? You know you live in Arizona when you can hear the weather forecast of 112 degrees without flinching. One night I was staying in Mesa overnight and uh, I heard him give the weather part says, and tonight's low will be down to 88. <laughs> and I thought, and coming from Oregon, I'm just like, okay, there's something about that that just seems strange, yeah. You know you live in Arizona when the best parking is determined by shade, not distance. You know you live in Arizona when you can make sun tea instantly. <laughs> you know you live in Arizona when sunscreen is sold year-round and kept right at the checkout counter. You know you live in Arizona when you can bake a lasagna in your mailbox. <laughs> that one was given to me recently by a resident of uh, Lakeside. So, oh, oh, you need to add this one to your collection. You know you live in Arizona when you put on fresh sunscreen just to go check the mailbox. You know you live in Arizona when you can correctly pronounce saguaro, canyon de chez, Mugion, ocotillo, and choya. You know you live in Arizona when you can say ho hokum and people don't think you're laughing funny. You also know you live in Arizona when your baby's first words are, yeah, but it's a dry heat. <laughs> you know you live in Arizona when you think the idea of driving while wearing oven mitts is actually quite clever. <laughs> is that an amen? Yeah, okay. <laughs> you know you live in Arizona, you wait, you wait until after sunset to buy ice cream and then head directly home. But it is a dry heat, I mean. You know you live in Arizona when vehicles with open windows have the right-of-way in summer. <laughs> you know you live in Arizona when school children run to the windows when it starts raining. <laughs> you know you live in Arizona when most of the restaurants in town have the first name of El or Los. You know you live in Arizona when people who have black cars with black upholstery are assumed to be from out of state or nuts. <laughs> you know you live in Arizona when you can finish a big gulp in 10 minutes and go back for seconds. Hey, hydration is important. You know you live in Arizona when 110 in the shade is sort of hot, but you don't have to shovel it off your driveway. You know you live in Arizona when petrified doesn't always or necessarily mean scared. And we're probably some of the closest people to that. You know you live in Arizona when you check the backyard for rattlesnakes and scorpions before letting the dogs out. Okay, <laughs> Move to Heber. You know you live in Arizona when you enjoy just sitting on your back porch and watching it rain during monsoon season. You know you live in Arizona when you realize that asphalt has a liquid state. <laughs> you know you live in Arizona when you know that most of these slides are true. And you know you live in Arizona when you are spoiled on beautiful sunsets. All right, jump us over to the next one then. And while we're doing that, Uh, a what tonight? An eclipse. Oh, uh, yeah, there is an eclipse tonight uh, about some of some 8:30. Well, at 9 o'clock 
The Eastern, yeah, subtract two hours for that and stuff. And uh, so three hours, except that we're on Mountain Standard Time, which is the same as Pacific Daylight. So that would be three. Yeah, OK, yeah. Anyway, something like that. Before we start, before we have the introduction, prayer, whatever, I mentioned earlier that these two rocks, you got your eyes on these? OK, just keep that in mind. So, Patrick, were you, do we need to do an introduction? or Nah, we good? All right, if you'll bow your heads, we'll have a word of prayer, and then we'll start our last session here. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for not only for being our Savior, but also for being our Creator and for revealing yourself to us not only through your word, but also through the incredible amount of evidence that you have given us that your word is true, that your word can be trusted, that your word is relevant, and from that... We receive the Holy Spirit, and that guides our lives and gives us hope, which many in this world do not have. And so through our witness, may we inspire hope in other people to know that they can trust you, that they can trust your word, and at the same time, behold the marvel and the beauty of your creation. We thank you for this. In the name of our Savior, Jesus, amen. amen. All right, people. Road trip. Oh, before I go on with this, I do want to say again, uh, in July, and you heard the dates this morning, that uh, Russ Miller um, is going to be your uh, guest speaker here, doing the same sort of a weekend sort of a thing that we had in July. And I just want to say, you know, he is, I told some of this the other night, I said, using a Las Vegas metaphor, I'm just the opening act, he's the headliner. And then I add to that, so now, of course, we say, well, Jesus is the headliner. And I say, yes. And when he takes the stage, the whole world's going to know, right? But um, his ministry, uh, he, he has his own ministry. He has several books that he's published. He has his own DVDs and stuff like that. So he's going to have resources available as well. I've personally taken the On the Bus with Russ tour twice. And if you, haven't, if you ever have an opportunity to do that, uh, he takes people through a tour of the Grand Canyon and not in the Grand Canyon, but you know, from the South Rim, and full of information, and his stuff is all very good. He's got a lot of interesting stuff on the Grand Staircase, which I'll be just barely touching on tonight, because my next talk that I'm working on currently is similar to this one, but it's just going to involve the whole state of Utah, basically, the national parks, the national monuments, the state parks, and stuff like that in Utah, because, I mean, there are neighbors to the north, and, but it's a you know, really handy way of saying, I mean, because we have the Grand Canyon, Okay, you don't get much better than the Grand Canyon. But Utah, southern Utah, is just full of wonderful geological things. And when you put on your biblical glasses and you look at the geology and you say, how could millions of years explain this? I think a biblical flood is way, makes way more sense, fits the evidence much, much better. Amen. So I uh, call this talk Road Trip, Evidence of Global Catastrophe in the Four Corners Regions and some historical and cultural facts as well from a biblical worldview, of course, okay? And I have a little uh, Monument Valley, in case you remember that, one of my absolute favorite places in Arizona. I have a little audio video check to do with you. This is a video produced by Pike Pitchers, the Pike family in Oregon. Um, I'm familiar with them because they were associated with the creation organization that I was with based in Portland before we moved down here. And they put together a, their own video documentary. And it's called Creation Explorers Tracking the Flood. And it talks about the evidence. Has anybody here familiar or heard of the term the Lake Missoula Flood? A uh, few people. OK, the Lake Missoula Flood happened in the Northwest. You'll see how it works here. But what I think is particularly enjoyable about this is that they, they involve young people, actors, uh, people in their 20s and 30s. And it's just really exciting to see young people portraying um, you know, evidence for, for creation. And, and the, the whole Lake Missoula flood theory was ridiculed and rejected for many, many years. And it, was, it took a lot of time and, and before people, geologists, secular geologists, were able to, because you, well, you'll see about that in the movie. But it took a long time for them to reverse their thinking. But thinking can be reversed. People can be persuaded. But again, we pray for them, and we are, I like the, the thing about, you know, people aren't projects, they're relationships. You know, that's wonderful. And uh, 
So as you interact with the people in your life, okay, my goal, my hope for you all, my prayer for you all, is that, that you know now that you have God's word on your side and, and you can confidently uh, share that. And if somebody raises up an objection, you also know that there are lots and lots of resources out there that you can go to. And if somebody asks you a, a tough question, you can say, you know, it's a really good question. Let me get some research, research on that and I'll get back to you. And you will be able to do that because the resources are there. God right now in 2022 is raising up an incredible army of people. I'm not including myself now. I'm talking about really good top-rated PhD scientists and observers and, and writers to bring this evidence to light so that people can see this and they can say, wow, yeah, the Bible makes much more sense than the story I was told in the museum or in school or what have you. So anyway, here is a little video clip of the creation explorers tracking the flood. We're told it was eons of time that shaped the Earth's most dramatic rock features. It was slow and gradual processes, working for millions of years, moving one grain of sand at a time. Yet before this theory was popularized, a completely different explanation had dominated scientific thought, one of violent and catastrophic processes. It is the explanation described within the Bible's account of Earth history, in which catastrophic floodwaters were the primary tool in shaping the Earth's surface very rapidly. Has science made it impossible for us to believe the Bible? No, there's good reason to doubt the millions of years theory that dominates geology, because there's a flood of evidence that supports the Bible's claim that catastrophic floodwaters have shaped the Earth's surface. Come on. Today we're going to explore some evidence from a proven catastrophic flood that ripped through our own backyard at the end of the Ice Age. It's called the Lake Missoula Flood. 540 cubic miles of water raced across much of Washington State. A significant thing about the Lake Missoula Flood are the erosional and depositional landforms that it produced. And those are very similar to other features that we see that were formed by even bigger, more catastrophic floods in the past. The Creation Explorers will journey into this flood's path into the Columbia River Gorge. They will explore the features carved by the Missoula Flood and see how these same features can be seen across the Earth the final recognition that catastrophes do happen and do affect the Earth as we know it has totally changed and actually overthrown uniformitarian thinking. This stream used to flow more gradually down to the Columbia River. When the Missoula flood came, it ripped away the rock, leaving only this steep cliff for the stream to fall from. Sheer cliffs in a canyon are a sign of a young canyon because with time, vertical faces are a lot faster than horizontal, so you have a lot of block fall, and so with time it become more V-shaped over millions of years. Sheer cliffs are everywhere across the earth. Well, where is all the rock debris? Not where slow erosion would have put it. An interesting thought here is if the earth is millions of years old and we have teleslopes happening in uh, just thousands of years, we shouldn't see any cliffs. And because we see cliffs, it speaks of the Earth not being that old. This evidence for catastrophic flood erosion shows us just how possible the Bible's global flood catastrophe can be. So the Creation Explorers examine some parts of Oregon, and, but especially eastern Washington, the Channel Scablands. And the, um, Be Becky Pike, who produced this, she says, I'm going to give you some of these, and uh, I'll, I'll give you some samples. And so I'm going to leave one of these with the pastor. And then you can figure out some way. You can watch it at home first, and figure out how you might want to share it with other people. But again, it, it shows a local regional catastrophe, and then all you have to do is just make some very, very simple extrapolations and say, well, if I can see these massive features that have been confirmed 
on a small scale. When I look at something like the Grand Canyon or Monument Valley or some of the other places that we're going to see today, you say, oh, yes, a catastrophic flood makes more sense than a little bit of water and lots of time. What we have here is lots of water in a little bit of time. So that being said, Start with scripture, 2 Peter 3, 3. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Keep that thought in mind. For this, they are, for this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God, the heavens are of old, and the earth, standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. Now, catch verse 7. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Noah's flood serves as a warning and a guarantee that there is a coming judgment, and everyone on this planet will be held accountable when that happens. As there was a judgment by water, so there will be a judgment by fire. Now, again, the crucifixion was the most significant event in human history. But what was the most significant geological event in human history? The obvious answer is the flood of Noah's day. Because of mankind's wickedness, and violence had filled the earth, God had to send a flood to destroy the earth. But as we've already said several times, we accept that we're going to make the Bible the foundation, the building block of our thinking in every area. And to do that, we metaphorically put on our biblical glasses so that everything we study, we're going to see through the lens of Scripture. And if something appears to contradict it, we're going to say, you know what, I'm going to hold off accepting that until... I confirm God's word, but we start with God's word. Evidence for a global catastrophic flood is one of the strongest proofs that A, that the Bible's account of history and God's dealings with mankind are trustworthy. B, therefore, God's promise of a coming judgment upon the earth is certain as well. And C, Therefore, all mankind is accountable to the Creator and judge who has also provided a means of salvation through Jesus Christ. And why is it one of the strongest proofs? It's because everybody can observe geology, okay? You don't have to have microscopes. You don't have to have telescopes. You don't have to have a PhD or a master's degree or a high school diploma, okay? The things we're going to discover today can be learned by somebody who's not even in middle school yet. I know that because I've been there. Assuming that the Genesis account of Noah's flood were true, what sort of physical evidence should we expect to find? We should expect to find sedimentary layers of rock laid down horizontally, extending hundreds and even thousands of miles. We should also see little or no evidence of erosion or passage of time between those sedimentary layers. They should look like one pancake stacked on top of another. We should see erosional features on a very large scale that exposes those layers. We would also expect maybe to find evidence of bending of the sedimentary rock layers while still soft because there was a lot of earth movements going on, okay? And we should also find fossils buried rapidly in the sediment layers. Now, to start with, we need to understand a little bit about where the uniformitarian, Bible-skeptic, non-believing people come from. And they subscribe, the geologists do, well, even the biologists have to, subscribe to a principle of uniformitarianism. It was uh, promulgated by a man by the name of James Hutton back in the 1800s. He authored a book called The Theory of the Earth, and in that he proposed that geologic processes such as erosion and deposition do not change over time. And so from there, the concept of uniformitarianism was established. The idea that the same process that we see shaping the earth today have been at work at the same rates throughout all of Earth's history. A phrase commonly used to associate this is, the present is the key to the past. So, what, so if we see sand 
slowly eroding off a cliff and slowly depositing over here, we say, oh, well, these are the same rates that's happened for millions and millions and millions and millions of years to create all this. But instead of the present is the key to the past, we as Christians know that the Bible is the key to the past. While if I were to say, would you consider the Bible a science textbook? Well, we'd say no. But if I said, would you consider this to be a history book? We say yes. This is a historical account of the history of the earth. And how does it begin? Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It wasn't millions of years ago, pond scum started moving. So, uniformitarianism. In geology, the doctrine suggests that Earth's geologic processes acted in the same manner and with essentially the same intensity in the past as they do in the present, and that such uniformity is sufficient to account for all geologic change. This principle is fundamental to geologic thinking and underlies the whole development of the science of geology. And that's from Britannica Online, okay? So if we can disprove the millions of years through geology, then what does that do to the biologists who also need millions and millions and millions of years for critters to form from pond scum to public speakers, okay? You get the idea, okay? So here's a little map of the Four Corners region that I pulled off the internet. I have up here, it says, whoa, excuse me, it says that all maps and satellite images are courtesy of maps.google.com unless otherwise noted. And I also use some Google uh, Earth things as well, okay? So let's just say, for uh, convenience sake, that you have some friends and they're coming from out of state and they're gonna fly into Arizona and they're gonna fly into Phoenix because they don't wanna pay the extra money to catch a little commuter flight up here to show though, right? Okay. And so you're going to meet them in Phoenix. You're going to do a big road trip. Now, let me just, first of all, explain. This presentation today was not based on a single road trip that I took with my wife. This was based as kind of a composite on several different trips we put together. Although, in theory, you could, if you had the resources and you want to have the time, you could make a road trip of this, of this sort, but not necessarily have to. If you are a traveling type of person or you have any kind of interest in geology or you think that uh, before gas is $9 a gallon, you want to get around and see some places, you might want to take some notes on some of these locations that we're going to cover, all right? So let's say that you have a friend and they're flying into Phoenix. And as they fly into Phoenix, they're going to see these mountains around Phoenix. There's called the White Tank Mountains are on the west of Phoenix. The Estrella Mountains are on the south of Phoenix and the McDowell Mountains to the north. Now, the McDowell Mountains on the north were said to have formed during the Miocene epoch in the tertiary period of the Cenozoic era. era. And you say, uh, what? What does all that mean? Okay, well, there's a fellow uh, by the name of Ray Troll has a, has a uh, little geologic column that he put up. And it tells you all these Paleozoic, Mesozoic, Cenozoic, and in there you have all these Holoc Holocene, Pleistocene, Pliocene, Creatius, Jurassic, Triassic, all that kind of stuff like that. Okay, and then he gives us a little, how many millions of years ago did each of these supposed layers form, okay, from dust blowing around and settling and creating itself. Now, I share this only as a reference because a much better explanation has been put together by this person here. This is Dr. Taz Walker. He's with Creation Ministries International Australia. We actually had the privilege of having him come to Payson several years ago and be a speaker. Uh, his work was in uh, energy power plants, but his, his background basically is in geology. And he came up with something called um, the biblical geologic model. He, there's a video that Answers in Genesis produced where he goes through and explains it himself, which again, you'd go to answers.com and you can find that. But Creation Ministries International also has the, the same video. And this is the graph of the biblical geologic model. So what we have to understand, I'm going to take some time to explain this, because once you have this model in place, okay, then as you begin this, if you drive around and you see geologic features, you could say, this must have happened between here and here. This must have happened at this point. So think about this. And if I might step over here. 4,000 years ago, or 4,000 BC, we had the creation. Now, the creation event lasted only one week. Okay, but in that one week, we had a lot of geological activity going on. We had, as he describes, the primordial, okay, which is the foundational, which is a ball of water, 
Okay, and then you had the ensuing phase, which was where the waters were gathered into one place and the land was gathered into one place. Okay, then you have the derivative. Okay, now we're bringing in the ecosystem, and then we have the biotic, which is where plants uh, are being formed. Okay, and then we have the pre-flood era. So for 1,700 years, approximately, you have a lot of time going by, but not much is happening geologically. Okay, now the fall has happened, but on a geological scale, not much is happening. And then, bingo, we have the flood, which lasted only one year, but in that one year, all kinds of geologic activity happened. We have what's called the eruptive phase, which would be in the first 40 days of the flood, when the fountains of the Great Deep were breaking open and the, and the whole earth was just becoming quite a mess, right? And 40 days, Eventually, we said that the ark this morning, it took 40 days before the ark became waterborne. From day 40 up to day uh, 90, we have the ascending phase, add 60 more days, brings us to day 150, the zenithic phase. That's where now everything is covered. All the high mountains are covered uh, to a depth of 50 meters. Then, after day 150, we know that God said that he created a wind to come over that. We also know that the mountains rose, the valley sank down. So as the continents now are coming up out of this ocean and all of the ocean waters are draining back into the ocean basin, the first phase, that would be called the abated phase. That's where you have water is just coming off in huge, huge, deep sheets, okay? And then this happened for about uh, so many days, 110 days. But after the abative phase, as that water level start to go down, start to go down, eventually the water will start to channelize, okay? And the waters will start to kind of form little places because as the water gets lower and lower, some of the rocks are going to erode very easily, okay? Some of those rocks are just going to turn right back into mud and they're going to be sloughed right out into the ocean basins. But some of the rocks are going to be a little bit harder, a little more resistant, and they're going to cause the water to go around them. That's going to form channels. And those channels will start forming gorges. Those gorges will start forming riverbeds, okay? And that's in the dispersive phase. Then you have the post-flood. Now everything's pretty much done with the flood, but we're still going to have residual geologic activity. We're going to still have volcanoes going off. We're still going to have earthquakes because the earth went through a big major upset, and it doesn't just calm back down right away. In fact, Dr. Steve Austin from the Institute for Creation Research has evidence to show that it was an exponential decline. It was still very violent at the beginning and it eventually tapered off. And then we have the modern phase where things are kind of at the level they are now. Uniformitarian geologists would have us say, no, everything that we see on the earth all happened at this modern rate. But we have God's word that says, no, there were some pretty violent things going on way back when, okay? And we need to take all of that into account. But here is the template that we're going to use as we look at different geologic features this afternoon. So let's start down in Phoenix, and we're going to zip up Interstate 17 up to Flagstaff. And when we get to Flagstaff, one of the first things you notice is the San Francisco peaks. Now, <clears throat> I said this was kind of a road trip, right? So I have to put in a plug. If you're going to be taking a road trip, I highly recommend you eat at a place called Cuisine, the uh, Delhi Palace. It's uh, behind the Walmart, back in this little area, back over there. Uh, it, it is the top-rated restaurant on TripAdvisor for the city of Flagstaff. Great food. And their buffet, uh, well, before COVID, it was like $8.95 for all you could eat for buffet. Not bad, if you like Indian food, anyway. So the Flagstaff area, if you go to Google, and then you switch to what's called the terrain view, you have different options. You could look at the road map, or you could look at the satellite image. But if you go to the terrain view, Oh, here's a picture of the restaurant, okay, the buffet, the salad bar, yeah, good. Cloth tablecloths, cloth napkins, okay, very nice. If you go to the terrain view, you see a topographical type of map. Every little black dot, if you could see it up there, and I don't know if you're, how your contrast is looking in there, every little pimple that you see there is a cinder cone or a volcanic cone. It's either, it's either a lava dome or a cinder cone formed by volcanic processes. In fact, now, the count right now currently is over 600 volcanic craters are found in this region around Flagstaff. Now, they're all essentially dormant now, but at one time they were active, and now they're dormant. 
So right, right off the bat, uniformitarian thinking starts to say, well, wait a minute, if it's along the same process, well, this process has stopped, so maybe the process was doing something more dramatic in the past. Well, again, if you uh, were to you know, go nose to nose with, a, with an evolutionist, they would say, well, not exactly. Well, then the counter to that is, well, then I guess the present is not the key to the past. OK. So, but we're not here to make, you know, we're not here to, to just get ugly on people okay, who disagree with us. We're not Pharisees. Well, we can't go there yet either. Uh, so on our first trip north out of Flagstaff, heading up Highway 89, we looked over, and this was uh, the uh, San Francisco peaks. Right now, the highest peak, Mount Humphreys, is 12,663 feet elevation at its summit. And it reminded us of something that we have the privilege of seeing in the Northwest. See what kind of similarities there are to that and to that. Does anybody recognize this? Mount St. Helens, yes, which erupted in 1980. I happened to actually, on that morning, be with the Army National Guard just uh, you know, 60 miles to the south. And I heard a loud boom about 8 o'clock. I just figured it was an ordnance piece going off for artillery or mortar round or something like that type of thing. Found out later it was an eruption. Okay? Mount St. Helens currently sits at 8,365 feet. But after Mount St. Helens erupted, this was, this was a fantastic boon for creationists, for Bible believers, because it, now we had a model that we, was observed to see what happens to a large mountain that suddenly loses a third of its height. Now, Mount Hood, by contrast, in Oregon, it's a volcano, but it is still dormant. It sits at 11,250 feet. Now, getting back to our friend, the San Francisco Peaks, San Francisco Peaks, it says, this is from a uh, website, are the remnants of a, the only stratovolcano in the San Francisco volcanic field. For decades, volcanologists suggested that the mountain, now called San Francisco Peaks, had simply worn away over time. That was the standard thinking. Because it was believed at one time that vol when volcanoes erupted, it was always a vertical eruption. Everything off the top. And so the San Francisco Peaks, to get their contour, had to just erode slowly, slowly, slowly. And then it says, you see, stratovolcanoes are known for their powerful explosive eruptions, like Krakatoa or um, Tambora. But they usually force their way upwards, producing a gaping crater at the top. They'd never seen a lateral blast volcano before until Mount St. Helens. Mount St. Helens, on the other hand, blasted sideways, leaving a bowl-shaped amphitheater where a nearly symmetrical mountaintop once stood. And then they have the pictures, the before and after pictures. OK. So. Compare the photographs with Mount St. Helens. Okay, and then on the, on the right side is the San Francisco Peaks. And they drew a line together to say, well, what would the San Francisco Peaks, what would their contour, their outline have looked like pre-eruption? And you see the resemblance there. So because of Mount St. Helens, okay, uh, a lot of the understanding of our own San Francisco Peaks had to be changed. We remember seeing the pictures. So here is San Francisco Peaks that I showed you a little while ago. Um, here's what the San Francisco Peaks could have looked like had it still had its top. It would have been over 16,000 feet high. 16,000 feet. Not so bad, is it? OK. So before the San Francisco Peaks blew, that was approx that's an approximation of what that peak would have looked like. I mean, you can see it from from Holbrook, you would have been able to see this from who knows how far away, right? Now, just as a contrast comparison, Mount Rainier in Washington, their tallest peak is only 14,000 feet, whereas Mount Denali in Alaska is 20,000 feet, OK? So we would have had a pretty awesome volcano had it not blown its top, OK? That's the first evidence that long, slow, gradual processes aren't what's in play here. Now, from Flagstaff, if you leave Flagstaff and you head east a little ways, and then you head up through some of these uh, Navajo Nation roads, it takes you to a place called Grand Falls. Has anybody here been to Grand Falls? One, two, three, four, not enough. OK, so we got to get you informed on how Grand Falls works. Let's go back to Google Satellite. This dark 
area that you see in the lower left, this is all a volcanic lava flow. This lava flow would have happened after the flood. How do we know this? Because there's no sediment on top of this. There's no evidence that any sedimentary rocks were laid down on top of this, of this lava. So this would have been a fairly immediate post-flood event. But what happened here? During the flood, as remember we talked about the abative and recessive phase, you have all kinds of sediment being scoured off, and then you have the little Colorado River being carved by this water that's going out through the riverbed of the little Colorado River. And then, and then, you have this volcanic lava flow going off, and at one point the lava flow went over and crossed over the little Colorado River bed and blocked the little Colorado River. So what did the little Colorado River do? It had to find a route around the lava flow and back and down. So to show you how that works, here's the area. This red line shows where, can you all see that? The red line shows where the original little Colorado River flowed. Then the lava flow came over and rerouted the river, so now it has to go around. And then when it goes back over, it has to drop down back into the gorge that was created. So this red arrow here points, it, could we dim these lights just a little bit more, some of that? I think, I mean, for me, it's a little bit harder to see the contrast. For you all, it might be better. OK, is this good? I'm going to take you through Google, uh, Google Satellite. Google Earth, excuse me, and we're going to put ourselves to the northeast of the Grand Falls area. And that's what it looks like. Now, do you see all of this grayish area is all the lava flow that came across and blocked the Little Cloud River. So it has to go around and come back in on the left-hand side there. So now I have a little video where I made just from the satellite where I take my mouse and I just zoom in and scroll in just to let you see a little more closely what this region looks like. Now you can access this from a passenger car. You don't need a four-wheel drive, high clearance vehicle. Uh, the road is pretty well maintained getting back there. And you can see this. Now I will also tell you that if you've been around a while, you know the little Colorado River doesn't usually have water in it very much. You have to catch it either during the monsoon season or during the spring runoff from the melting snow that comes down from the White Mountains, OK? So, but here is a side-on shot of the lava that flowed over. And what you can barely, barely see on the top are a little tiny gazebo and a little observation deck there. And they even have restrooms, so you, know, you can stop there and visit. It is on Navajo Nation land, but there's no fee to get back in. But you have to kind of know where you're going. And, but there are, there are maps that will show you how to get there. This is a picture that I took not too long ago of the Grand Falls. Now, Grand Falls also has a nickname. Does anybody know what that is? Chocolate, Chocolate Falls, yes. Why is that? Because when it runs, it looks like your nest is quick. But here's the point. The Little Colorado River Gorge had to be cut first before the lava flow occurred. If this happened millions of years ago, why is there still a waterfall there? If the Little Colorado River has been flowing like it has, even as intermittent as it is throughout the seasons, if it happened for millions and millions of years, that water should have eventually cut that waterfall down to where it's just going to meander around and come back in. OK? So the fact that we still have a waterfall there shows that uh, long, slow, gradual isn't working, isn't working. So let's look again at our chart. When would this have occurred? The little Colorado River gorge would have been cut during the dispersive phase when the sheet flow had slowed down. And now all the water is finding out little rivers and little streams like that to work its way out. The lava flow then would have happened right afterwards, the residual phase to block that river, and the river has simply rerouted and has not had time to cut through the waterfall to make it bring it all back down to the same level. Not hard to understand at all, is it? Okay. Why is it not hard to understand? It's not hard to understand because we start from the biblical perspective. So from Flagstaff, we've gone out here to Grand Falls. We're going to backtrack now, head over on 89, and head up to just outside of Tuba City. But on the way up, of course, you'll see 
Sunset Crater National Monument. Again, this is just another example of some of the volcanic activity that was in that area. But you get up to uh, Highway 160, and then you see a sign. You start heading towards Tuba City, and you'll see a sign about dinosaur tracks. And one, one of our earliest visits there, this is what the sign looked like. The next time we visited, they replaced the sign and made it look like that. The next time we went by, they replaced the sign and made it look like that. The next time we replaced the sign, we went by, they had replaced the sign to look like that. And most recently now, they have this, okay? And so the tracks are open. So you turn right there where you see the sign, and you go back to this place. It's, it's a little district called Moanavi. And you go back there, and there are some little booths where some Navajos will have their jewelry and stuff like that for sale, okay? You do not have to hire a Navajo guide to take you around and show you. You can. It's your option, okay? The first time around, yeah, we did. A young boy named Evan took us around and showed us some different things. After a subsequent visit, it's like, we know our way around. We're good, okay? And you will see footprints, dinosaur footprints, in the solid rock, three-toed dinosaur footprints. And the dinosaurs, the, this, the type of dinosaur has been identified as the Dilophosaurus. There is also this. This is a coprolite. For those of you who are in the know, you know that coprolite is dino dung, fossilized dino dung. There's also a spot where you can find fossilized dino eggs embedded in the limestone. Now, uh, a fellow by the name of Doug Sharp has a website called Revolution Against Evolution, and he documents in here that there is a place where human footprints have also been found with the in the same layer as the dinosaur footprints. However, in the past, when those kind of discoveries have been made, Somehow, in short order, those footprints have been mysteriously chiseled away or destroyed by somebody who didn't want other people to see that evidence. So he has been very careful to not publish the location, the GPS coordinates of where you would find that. But how do we explain dinosaur footprints? How, where would they come about? Now, remember, we talked about it took the eruptive phase 40 days before Noah's flood was waterborne, and the water kept rising. So somewhere in this eruptive or ascending phase, think about this now. Think about you are a dinosaur, and you see habitat being wiped out, and you see tsunami waves coming in, and you're like, I don't like this. And so you're fleeing to higher ground. That's instinctive, OK? Animals don't have to be told mountains are high, valleys are low. So they're going to flee to higher ground. But now let's say that you're out there and you're kind of stranded on this little spot. And then the next tide goes out and there's a big mud flat out there. And you see that, oh, over there looks like a better place to be. So as the water has gone out, you now have an opportunity to get over to the next highest place to seek refuge. And after you scurry away, the next surge comes in, brings in a lot of mud, drops it down, preserves your tracks. And you're stuck at the next place. And eventually, you're stuck until you can't go anyplace else, and you're buried or you're washed out in the tide. So dinosaur footprints and other types of footprints as well would have been laid down during this, during this phase when each successive layer is being brought in, tide goes out, brought in, tide goes out. And this is going on for half a year. So uh, if you ever want to stop in page there or outside of page, you can do that. Now from page. We're going to zip up, I mean, from Tuba City, excuse me, we're going to head up to Page. And when you get up to Page, of course, one of the things that makes Page what it is is the, um, the Glen Canyon Dam. Authorized in 1956, it was completed in 1963. That's when Lake Powell was formed. But in 1983, something happened. Awesome Science Media has a series of videos called, well, this is Kyle Justice. He's the producer. He is the father of his son, Noah Justice. And when Noah was about 12 years old, they decided to produce a series of videos featuring his son as the main uh, master ceremonies of the host, OK? And here's a series, uh, Awesome Science with Noah Justice. And so th from this series, 
he talks about the Grand Canyon. And there was a ser there's a segment where he talks about something called cavitation, which we have to look at today to understand how that The works. following clip is from the Explore the Grand Canyon episode of Awesome Science. You might want a little more. So this was from a segment about the Grand Canyon. I didn't put the Grand Canyon in this talk because there's many, many, many other videos talking about Grand Canyon. Russ Miller, of course, is going to give you a great talk on that, I'm sure, when he's here. It was determined later that the original obstruction that caused the cavitation was a one quarter inch high calcite deposit. It had dripped down, had formed a little tiny bump on the bottom of that tube. And then when they, all that water was going over, under that speed, under that pressure, because of that depth, it set up the whole cavitation process. Now I want you to understand how the cavitation part works because if it did that to solid concrete and rebar, Imagine what fast moving water can do to still wet sediment as it's running off at the end of the flood. Would have ripped through it like a hot knife through butter. Cavitation, the rapid formation of vapor pockets in a flowing liquid in regions of very low pressure, a frequent cause of structural damage to propellers and pumps. And this again is the picture of the pit that was made. And we, we, and how many thousands of cubic yards of concrete? Like a lot to repair this thing. It was a ugly, ugly mess. But you know what? There's something in our recent history not too long ago that happened at the Oroville Dam in California. Does anybody remember that from the news? In February of 2017, the Oroville Dam in California had the same problem. It filled up so fast that they had to open the spillway to let water out because it looked like it was threatening to breach the dam. The water came flowing over and the cavitation of the water ripped up through the concrete, breached the sidewall, tore out all of this solid rock that you see on the right hand side there in a matter of minutes. And that was hard layers of rock. Again, think about what would have happened at the end of the flood when all these layers are still soft and the water is pouring over them. It would have been a real fast mess. Okay, so from Page, as we're heading out from Page now, we're heading a little ways to the east. Um, there we go, just a little dot there. And we're gonna go take a visit to Antelope Canyon. A lot of us have heard about Antelope Canyon. Uh, it was operating a pretty good clip pre-COVID, and then they had to shut everything down because it's under the jurisdiction of the Navajo Nation, and they just shut it all down. And I understand that they have recently opened it back up, but at a much more limited capacity, which means that the tours fill up more quickly, which means you have to book farther in advance to get in to go take a tour to see Antelope Canyon. Uh, the time that we went, oh, and the word for Antelope Canyon is, say, Big Hanalini. Sounds almost Hawaiian, doesn't it? You know, But uh, we went through Antelope Canyon tours, and they had these white trucks with the, with the little things in the back. But some of these companies, I'm sure they probably had to sell off their fleet to survive the uh, COVID. And some others probably went under and don't exist anymore. I don't, you know, it's just kind of hard to say what the current status is of Antelope Canyon Tours is up in Page. But as you go back, you drive through the wash. Yeah, the only way you can get in there actually is with a Navajo tour guide because people have gone in there and been trapped in a flash flood and drowned. So now it has to be under licensed operations. So you get back there and who's that fellow on the left? Oh, well, never mind. Don't pay any attention to him. Anyway, taking a Google Earth shot, okay, this, if you can see it cleverly, this is the parking area, this is the, the wash where all the sand is, then there's this rock feature right here, and Antelope Canyon goes right through, then there's this upper part there, where you, so you can see where the riverbed would have come down, and then it does something where it has to breach through this rock to continue to flow outward. Now there is an upper and a lower Antelope Canyon, this is the upper Antelope Canyon. Now, before the water, if you're thinking like an evolutionist, the water is coming down. If it's just a little bit of water, like it is nowadays, which is only during the monsoon seasons, how would it ever breach over or through a rock? Okay, water doesn't just climb uphill and go back down the other side. Okay, water seeks its own level. So you would have had to have enough water at some point in time to build up behind this rock ledge to then spill over to start the cutting process. But we don't see anywhere near that type of level of water nowadays. 
And besides, with all the sandy bottom, the rain that does come usually just goes so far into the ground. So uniformitarian process right from the get-go cannot explain Antelope Canyon. Okay? There's no evidence that there ever was a waterfall on the other side because that would have created what's called a plunge pool where the water comes down and eventually erodes a little pit. But for those of you who have had the privilege of being able to tour in Lope Canyon, the sights that you will see are just absolutely amazing. And depending on the time of day that you go and the time of year that you go will depend on the position of the sun, will depend on how the shadows and the colors and everything else looks. But even inside the canyon, you see some things that say, OK, if this was carved by little by little by little by little, OK, and you want to suppose that little drops of water came down and they eroded and took away a little piece of sand here, a little piece of sand there, then you come to an area like this where you see a big bullshit like a vortex was in here making a huge circular pit. And you say, raindrops don't form vortexes, <laughs> OK? Vortexes are formed by lots of water moving very, very quickly. This is looking up in one area. Another shot looking up. Sometimes some other boulders have kind of impaled themselves or logs. This next picture uh, was taken by my wife. We just happened to be on this one particular day with this one particular spot at one particular time. And it came out like this with these beautiful rainbow colors. It was awesome. You see the yellows and ambers and reds and blues and purples. And we had this made into a canvas print, which just hangs in our house. And it's just, it was like one of those one in a million type of shots that you can see. So you go through, you come back out. Here's what it looks like at the beginning, you can see. So just look at this. You're trying to imagine how would water breach over, down, through, if it's only occasional monsoons, seasonal rains, even if there was a, a stream that flowed maybe and could move 50 gallons of water a second or 100 gallons of water a second, how could it cut through something like this and leave the type of remnant that it did? A much better explanation is, as the floodwaters were racing off and coming out, this area was still soft and water was able to penetrate and it just whoosh, went right through and made this, drained out, and left us with this beautiful Antelope Canyon. So again, when would this Antelope Canyon have been formed? Using our biblical geologic model, the best understanding would put it right here at this uh, uh, dispersive phase when the water is coming together and channelizing and cutting through and taking out narrow things, not big sheet erosion. Not just yet anyway, but we'll see evidence of that in a little bit. While you're up in Page, we have yet to see Rainbow Bridge. It is the largest natural bridge on North, in the North American continent. But um, while you're up in Page and you're hungry, Stromboli's Pizzeria, great food. They even have gluten-free crust, OK? Vegetarian and vegan options as well. If you look to the east, you'll see Navajo Mountain. We're going to talk about Navajo Mountain in a bit. I'm just, I mention it now only because this is the first time you'll see it on this particular trip. But as you head out, you will come to this little place here. There's Navajo Mountain. And then you come to Navajo National Monument. Navajo National Monument is a little place where you can see some ruins. In fact, this is the main one that they feature, Batatican ruins. Now, they won't let you go inside Batatican ruins. They only allow the tours during between Memorial Day and Labor Day. And you have to be there early, and you have to have you know, a guided tour type come in because they've had some rocks fall off the thing and land. They don't want anybody to get hurt, OK? Now, if you've driven around the Southwest, you've probably seen alcoves like this many, many places. Not all of them have ruins, of course. But this raises the question, how did alcoves like this, these little cubbies, form? An evolutionist would have to say, well, little by little by little, it just kind of eroded away, eroded away, eroded away. There's no stream or river going into there, so it had to just be gradual. It just had to be rocks just kind of slowly decomposing. If that were true, where is all the rock debris from coming down? We're not accusing the Anasazi Indians of going in there with wheelbarrows and shovels and hauling it all out, OK? That wouldn't work. Seasonal monsoon rains aren't deep enough to carry rocks like that out. So the absence of debris 
from whatever causes carving out isn't there. And it should be there according to evolutionary standards. However, if there was a global flood sweeping through the area during that abated phase, it would have plucked these things out and sent them on down the way. So again, evolutionism, uniformitarianism fails, biblical flood model prevails. All right, so from Antelope, I mean from uh, Navajo Mountain, we zip up here by Cayenta, and you'll pass something called Agathla Peak, also known as El Capitan. But we're heading to Monument Valley Navajo Tribal Park. Anybody been to Monument Valley Navajo Tribal Park? We've got to get more people on this. Okay. You'll, you'll get on Highway 163. You'll barely cross into the Utah state line. You go about a, a little tiny ways, and all of a sudden here's a driveway that says Monument Valley Navajo Tribal Park. You take a right. You go back in. While you're driving on the driveway, you're re-entering Arizona. You come to a place called the View Hotel, which has a very unique history, which we don't have time to go into today. But it's, a, it's built by Navajos, operated by Navajos, built on the edge of a, of a ledge. You park in the parking lot, you walk through a door, you come out, and you emerge onto a patio. And this is what you get to see. You might recognize this from a few John Wayne movies. Because the director, John Ford, loved to shoot out here, and John Wayne loved to come out here and be in movies with him. And here is the Navajo spelling. It looks like Klingon to me, so I won't even try to read that one. But it means in Navajo, the clearing among the rocks. You didn't mention that there's a restaurant there. You haven't let me get that far yet. <laughs> you're not hungry yet. When you see this, you're like, you, you, you forget about your hunger. And you're just like, wow, this is so cool. And you want to get your cameras out and take all kinds of pictures. Depending on the time of day and the cloud cover, it might look like this. This is Merrick Butte. And it was only recently when we got a video of, of the history of Navajo Valley that we figured out where Merrick and Mitchell Butte got their names. But this is Merrick Butte. Just by looking at it, can you make an estimate as to how big do you think it is? Big as a house? Big as a city block, maybe? Bigger than that. Well, that little tiny dot that you see down there is actually a vehicle with people standing around looking at it. This thing is like about three city blocks long and about three city blocks high. But going back to this here. Oh, by the way, from the hotel, this is the observation. This is looking back at the hotel. There's a like hundred and some odd plus rooms. All but a few of them face the valley. They all have patios, and when you check in, they've got a little something, a little extra treat, which I'll show you in a second. Uh, around this area is, this was called John Wayne's Point. This is where his, John Wayne's favorite place to view Monument Valley from. John Ford has his own point where he liked to shoot from, which is out on, uh, a little farther out. But you've paid to get into the park, and whether you're staying at the hotel or not, doesn't matter. You have access to drive your vehicle into and around a little 14-mile drive, if you want to take the whole 14 miles or just part of it. So you come in, and you drive around. And this is Elephant Butte, because you kind of sort of can see the elephant and his trunk, and his head is on the right, and the rest of his body is on the left. And this is Camel Rock, OK, because it looks kind of like a camel. And then you have the Three Sisters and the Totem Poles. And this is just an area, a picture taking back, looking back through the area. This is, again, the picture of the hotel now taken from a distance. And you see how it's sitting on top of these sedimentary layers of rock? I'm going to throw a grid down on top of it, and you'll see that they are horizontal. They are flat. There's no evidence of erosion or anything between those layers. They just go on for miles and miles and miles. I want to quickly get back to this butte here, Mary Butte. Here is the uh, geographical composition. The very bottom layer is called the Oregon Rock Shale. Above that, you have this big vertical part called the Deshay Sandstone. Then I have a little green and red slash line. Above that, you have the Moen Copy Formation. And on the very, very top, you have the Shinarump Formation. I'm glad I'm not the guy that got the, that named after him. OK, Mr. Shinarump. If there were millions or hundreds of thousands or even just thousands of years old, there should be all kinds of erosion between those layers, but there isn't, OK? So here we have the Triassic and the Permian barrier. That's why the, the lines are two different colors, OK? So they say that 
this Triassic and this Permian layer were laid down millions of years ago. So when did the Triassic and the Permian layers exist? Well, we go back to this website here, and we look, and it gives us about 252.2 million years ago, okay? So let's go back and look, and it's like, okay, are you saying then that there's this big time gap, and yet it's still perfectly horizontal with no erosion? And then you explain all the millions of years it took to form the Deche sandstone here, you say, so for 30 million years, 40 million years, the only kind of sand grains that were blowing around all had the same color, all were the same composition, all were made of exactly the same thing for 50 million years. I mean, even for 20 years, it wouldn't make sense that there was only one kind of sand grain blowing around. And then how did it get cemented? This is out in the desert. So it doesn't take, like I say, you know, once you start with God's word, and you build your thinking on God's word, you look at this, you say, man, a global flood just absolutely, absolutely makes way more sense. Long, slow, gradual, millions of years, human formatarian, blah, 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 okay? And these same layers extend to all of these formations in the Monument Valley, which means that this entire valley was filled with the same rock layers at one time, and then something took, whoosh, everything else away and sent it far, far away to like the Gulf of California, to the Pacific Ocean, okay? Because there's no evidence. If it was just slowly breaking down by sand particles, then why aren't, don't we see more sand dunes around that area, okay? We do not because they don't exist because they were never formed by that process. So on a website, monumentvalley.org, geology, okay, it says that Oh, deposited by streams, the Oregon Rock Shale. That's the, that's the base of this thing. Then it says the Deche Sandstone, listen to this, windblown dune deposits produce this type of deposition, but yet nowhere else do we see windblown sand dunes creating solid rock pillars out in the middle of the desert. Great sand dunes are not turning into hard stone. Yeah, for thousands of years, the only type of dirt blowing around was exactly the same color, making the same layers. Now, this, is, by the way, is uh, West Mitten Butte, and I think I have added in here. So I showed you pictures in the afternoon. Sunsets are really, really cool. Also, if you're out there taking pictures, you get these beautiful colors like this, and a little bit darker ones look like this. So. When would Monument Valley have been formed? When would these rock layers and these remnants have been formed? This would have been during that abative phase where it's every, all the water that's coming off the continent now, going onto the oceans, is flowing in huge sheets, and it's taking all of this soft sedimentary mud with it. But there were some areas, okay, if it was sandstone, it was quartz, and if it was limestone, it was lime, that if there was certain higher concentrations of the cementing agent in certain areas, those rocks would have been just a little more resistant to the erosion. And so the water would have gone around them. And it's very easy to explain that because, you know, we look at it and say, well, obviously this is still here, but obviously everything else whew, has been vacuumed out, okay? As for the restaurant, the View Hotel does have a very nice place. And when you check into the lobby, this is what it looks like. When you go to the checkout counter, they have a little thing on the side showing sunset and sunrise times for the people who want to make sure they've got their cameras out for sunset and sunrise. But they do have a really nice restaurant. The last time we were there, after they recently reopened, the restaurant was closed, but the one across the highway at Goulding's Lodge was open. And we surmised it was because there just weren't enough people visiting yet, coming back in yet, to bring the operation back online for the restaurant. But Goulding's, op Goulding's Lodge has a very nice restaurant. You can eat across there. It's not so bad. Uh, this is a picture of my wife and her friend Kathy while I was taking the picture, OK? And uh, so again, we look at the idea of where did the sediments go? They had to go somewhere. And they had to have an agent remove them. It was either going to be wind or water. And if it was wind, we should see a lot more dust, and we should see sand dunes, and we should see other residue around there. As the sun goes farther down, you see more and more. And if you stay overnight, you'll catch sunrise coming up in the east, behind the buttes. How about that one? 
one time we were there, it was in December, and we were getting ready to have dinner. The sun had gone down, and all of a sudden we see all these people running out to the window, looking at us like, ooh, is there somebody out there? Is somebody out there having a heart attack? Did somebody fall down and hurt themselves? So there's, people are suddenly running over there. It was a full moon coming up behind the buttes. Well, a year later, we're taking another trip out there because I had the week off and we, we did a vacation. And after we booked, my wife says, hey, I wonder when the next full moon is. And it's like, look, it's going to be on the same time that we're out there. Very cool. So we had our cameras ready. And my wife, with her good camera, was able to catch a full moon rising, still just right around sunset, so you could still see light catching the butte as well as the full moon. Now, other good news, though, is that recently, they have initiated a trail called the Wildcat Trail, which you can sign the little trail log, and you can walk out, and you can go out behind the West Mitten Butte, between those two buttes, around, out, and back, and come back. And, so you, can, and you don't have to have a Navajo guide. You just have to make sure you get back before sunset. But uh, it's a, so you get to actually get in the hike. It's not such a bad deal. All right, we're going to move down the road now from this area. Go to this place called Monument Pass. Anybody recognize this place from a movie that was released in like 1976, maybe, perhaps? Filmed right here. And, and most of us, most of us remember him saying this. I'm pretty tired. Thank God I'll go home now. Pretty tired. Thank God I'll go home now. That was filmed at Monument Pass. And if you watch the movie carefully, you can see that in the very, very distance, there is a roadblock, and they've got traffic piled up. They had to stop the traffic so they could do, shoot the scene. But, and you, anyway, it's kind of a cute little thing. Next time you want to watch Forrest Gump. So as we're leaving that area, there are four sites that we're going to quickly check out. Mexican Hat Rock, Gooseneck State Park, Valley of the Gods Scenic Drive, and then the Moki Dugway. And throw them all on the map right now so you can see them, so here they work. This is Mexican Hat Rock. It was called Mexican Hat Rock because they didn't, up there. <laughs> they didn't want to call it Sombrero Rock because they figured people would not, not know what that was. So anyway, so Mexican Hat Rock is this little flat rock sitting on top there. And you can drive into it. You can drive right up close to the base of it and look up there at it. It was some, allegedly, according to evolution, f uh, part of the Alguito Formation, which would put it way down here at about, at the, right at the top of the Permian layer, no, Pennsylvania layer, yeah, Pennsylvania layer, and the Pennsylvania layer is about 299 million years ago. And it's been sitting there ever since, just peacefully passing the time away. Doesn't sound too likely. At the current erosion rates, that thing should have come down quite a long time ago, if it had actually been formed that long ago. Gooseneck State Park. You drive out to Gooseneck State Park, and you come to the sun. There's really nothing there. Just a, 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 there's just a little deck that you can go out and you look at the San Juan River. But the San Juan River, from a satellite image, okay, has this really interesting meander where it goes back and around and back and around and back and around. And this, it says Goosenecks Campgrounds. This, Little spot right here. It's kind of like Horseshoe Bend up by Page. Uh, you have to take a panorama shot to get the whole thing in. And this is an example of what's known as an incised meander or an entrenched meander. Okay. Now, for the people up in Oregon, they know that the Tualatin River meanders in very much the same way. But it is a very, very slow-moving river. In fact, it looks like it's not even moving at all, practically. Okay? Very slow meander. I mean, meandering sort of stream like that usually don't go very fast. But the San Juan River really tears through there. So in an effort to explain how the San Juan River can be meandering and yet still be moving quickly, they come up with this big, big, big comment. Say, well, perhaps maybe millions of years ago when this was doing, and because these things, you know, they did this thing. And then they say, then for reasons related to tectonics, rearrangement of lithospheric plates, or climate, or both, we really don't know. And then they go on to come up with their little explanation of what they think happened. And that's from the National Park Service. OK. Now we take you to the Valley of God Scenic Drive. You don't have to pay any money to get in here. 
Um, it's a gravel road. You may want to take a higher clearance vehicle, although a sedan would probably work. Okay, And you just get to drive through and look at the same sort of rock formations at no cost. On um, TripAdvisor.com years ago, it ranked Valley of the Gods Drive as number one of 598 things to see in Utah. Out of the entire state, this is ranks fairly high. People really liked it. And it got a, almost a four and a half out of five with 32 reviews. All right, back on the highway, we're going to head to the Moki Dugway. What is the Moki Dugway? You'll see in a minute. But you're going to be approaching the highway, approaches Cedar Mesa. And this, what you see right there, is Cedar Mesa. Then you see the sign says 10% grades, five mile an hour switchbacks, narrow gravel road, one mile ahead. You say, where are we going? Then you see the sign says 800 feet, pavement ends. From the satellite view, this is what it looks like. Boom, 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 boom. And then you start the climb. And you see these layers. You're climbing up through these layers here. Now, I just happen to take a little, no audio on this video, but this shows you what it's like if you're driving up in a rental car or others. Keep an eye on these layers as you see them coming up on your ride. This is, this is a very close analogy to what you would see if you could drive your car through the Grand Canyon. And how many of us, while we're watching this, have been on Highway 77, gone down into Salt River Canyon to back? Okay, you know what you're like. Okay, <clears throat> it's a very similar sort of thing. You're looking at these layers, but again, these layers are all flat like a pancake. If they were, if it took millions of years to form each layer, they shouldn't be flat like that, and they shouldn't be uniform as they go through the thickness. It should just be a whole hodgepodge of stuff. And by the way, you notice that the road is fairly flat. They, they always keep it well graded, and the corners are nice and wide, so you never have to worry about you know, going around a sharp little corner and then having some semi come around and take you out. Almost there, a few seconds later. And you see it layers, and we'll stop. OK, when you get to the top, this is the view looking back. And there is this sign right here that says, in three miles, you climb 1,100 feet. And you are now at 6,425 feet elevation. Pretty close to where we are here. Then there's this sign, and it talks about the Mogi Dugway. It was built in 1958 by Texas Zinc. It was a mining company to transport uranium from the Happy Jack mine in Fry Canyon, Utah, down to Mexican Hat, where there was a processing plant. And then it talks about the term Mogi is derived from a Spanish word, which is used by Spanish explorers to describe the Pueblo settlers. Today, the standard term used to describe these prehistoric Native Americans who lived more than 1,000 years ago is ancestral Puebloans. Okay. It is based on the present-day Puebloan tribes and archaeologists' belief that these people were the answers of today's Hopi, Zuni, Acoma, and Rio Grande region cultures. You may also see them commonly referred to as the Anasazi, which is a Navajo word meaning enemy ancestors. But there are some people who say, oh, we shouldn't use the term Anasazi because it's cruel. It might trigger somebody's microaggression. So we should call them ancestral Puebloans. So even political correctness is getting into this kind of stuff. But now you are at an area known as part of the Grand Staircase. And like I say, Russ Miller has some great information on the Grand Staircase. But as if the layers in the Grand Canyon aren't enough, This is the north rim of the Grand Canyon. You follow this out. There are 10,000 more feet of sediment on top of where the Grand Canyon is. And most of it has been eroded away. It's been tilted and sheared off and bent. If you were to stack them all up vertically without the, the bending down, it would be pretty high, like that. So here, again, and they say this is the Triassic. This is taken off a secular website, Triassic, Jurassic. Here's Arizona. Here's Grand Canyon. OK. And if you've ever been to Bryce Canyon, Bryce Canyon is way up there. So there's 10,000 more feet, almost two miles of sediment laid down on top of the layers that we see at the Grand Canyon. And it is called the Grand Staircase because if you get the right spot, Grand Canyon, Bryce. 
you see you have the Vermilion Cliffs and the Chocolate Cliffs and the Pink Cliffs and the White Cliffs. Uh, well, actually, White pink Cliffs, Pink Cliffs. Okay, so we've been here for a little bit. We have a kitty cat stretching. So in class, if I think the students have been sitting for a while and need a little bit of a break, okay, everybody stand up. If you feel like standing up, you can stand up. If you don't feel like standing up, you don't have to stand up. Stretch a little bit, okay? You got five seconds just to kind of stretch. All right, you're so ready to go. See, I built that in for your convenience. Okay, Betty, back to the lesson. All right. Monument Valley, we went up to the Moki Dugway. We're going to come back down and we're going to head over to the Four Corners region. A lot of us know Four Corners where the states all come together. They have this little plaque where you can do, you know, stand there and do the thing. And then we're going to go into the town of Ship Rock, the town of Ship Rock, New Mexico. Okay. And remember in the video I showed you a little bit ago of Creation Explorers, there was this picture. This is in the Northwest. Most people in Washington, Oregon area know about. This is called Beacon Rock. It is a is basalt lava, and it's been solidified. It's the neck of a volcano, and the the material that surrounded the volcano to, so that the lava, which was wet, could come up and hold it in place till it solidified, was all scoured away during that. Missoula flood that, that tore through the Columbia Gorge and ripped away everything else, but because the basalt here was very hard, it stayed behind, okay? And it's only like 800 and some, yeah, 848 feet tall, okay? And again, that was, it was mentioned in this video. And Pastor, we can talk a little bit more about this, but if uh, you want to get a hold of a copy of this, okay, it is available. Uh, oh, at the website there, creationtoday.org. That's where you can get a copy of that as well. But it brings us to this wonderful rock formation here, which is Ship Rock, which in Navajo is this, which means a rock with wings. This is also a volcanic remnant. Now, you don't have to have a geology major to understand that magma comes up, it is liquid. And so liquid tends to find its own level. So for this to come up, had to have some sort of material encasing it while the lava was coming up and being formed, had to hold it in place long enough for the lava to harden, but then some force, okay, serious water, had to then strip it all away and take it out of the way. And so this neck of this volcano again, is evidence that at some point in time, there was a lot more mud and dirt out here that has all been stripped away. So you have the deposition, you also have the erosion, you also have volcanic activity. From a satellite view, you have those two, those are volcanic dikes, okay? Like the dike for the boy, stick his finger in the dike type thing, they're vertical. So as this volcano was doing this thing, cracks formed, and magma came up and hardened in there as well. On our very first trip by there, we saw this. We had all these beautiful clouds circling the rock. Other trips, we saw other sorts of things, depending on, again, depending on the time of day. This was in the afternoon because the, the sun is on the west side and we were looking north here. Uh, this, was in, uh, this was probably late morning when this shot was taken. Here's a picture of my wife standing next to my beautiful blue Toyota pickup. Now, <clears throat> you look at Shiprock and you say, okay, yeah, it looks pretty impressive, pretty big. Okay, the elevation at the base is 5,600 feet. The prominence rises 1,583 feet. What does 1,583 feet look like? It is taller than the Empire State Building to the tip of the antenna. If you built another replica of the Empire State Building to scale, it would be look like that, next to Ship Rock. And this is a picture of me standing by that vertical dike, like I told you about. It's made of a material called minute, which is, well, basically it's a composition of minute, which is basalt that has a high ratio of silica in it, okay? Another aerial view. There's no sand dunes anywhere to be found, no rolling hills showing that 
air, wind has been pushing these grains away. It's been stripped. You can drive from here all the way down to Gallup for almost two hours, and you won't see any evidence of this material. It's just all gone. It had to have been taken someplace way, way far, far away. No sand dunes, no rolling hills. Now, I mentioned before, Navajo Mountain and Agathla Peak. So we're going to go back now and take a quick look at them. Agathla Peak, as you're leaving Cayenta, looks like this. Another volcanic neck. The base elevation there is 5,660 feet. The promise only rises a mere 1,436 feet. By the way, the term Agathla in Navajo means much wool because they raise a lot of sheep over there. But as you're driving around this region, These volcanic features are all over. Here's one. Some of these have no names. Now, this map right here shows the Navajo volcanic field. I just ran across this not all that long ago. I know it's kind of hard to see in this map, but if you can see, every little blue triangle that you see there is an eruption of magma that's exposed above the ground that had to have something encasing it while the magma was hardening, and then it's been stripped away and exposed. And everywhere you see a little yellowish-orange line is where there has been a fault has occurred. So this place was rocking and rolling at the end of the flood. Now, I mentioned Navajo Mountain. Navajo Mountain sits at an elevation of 10,388 feet. And it is, in geologic terms, described or classified as a lacolith. What is a lacolith? Not a term that most of us are familiar with. A lacolith means that the magma was coming up through the layers, and then it got to a certain layer, and it couldn't breach the layers because they were too soft. So it basically formed a bubble, formed a cavity, formed a pimple, if you like. Okay. And so, but in order to form this, these upper mountains, would those layers have to be hard or soft for this blister to occur? Had to have been soft still. So when you look at Navajo Mountain, you see the layer there. Those layers, those upper layers, would have not been solid. They would have been, in order to flex, they had to have been, they had to have been soft. Otherwise, they would have split, and Navajo Mountain would be a volcano then at that point. But it is not. All right. From there, we're going to come over the Chuska Mountains. And as we cross over the Chuska Mountains, you get to a place called Buffalo Pass. You look back, and you can see ship rock from a distance there. You go through the town of Lukachukai. It has very similar rock features to Sedona, but it's a much more primitive little place. You come to the visitor center at Canyon de Chez and it's being a national monument and they're particularly unless they've changed there's no entrance fee to get in there but if you're one of those people who has an america the beautiful pass lifelong thing you can get in anyway for free after you paid it and here's the layout here and this is from the official website and of the area they say that um the Deshay sandstone, light red rock of uniform grain, was formed from desert sand dunes. Oh, here we go with the desert sand dune thing again, right? By, oh, northerly winds. Well, by now you're probably thinking, I bet it was probably water with a northerly current building these things up. And then about the Shinarunt conglomerate, it says that it was stream deposited. Why do they say it was stream deposited? Well, because there's rounded bits of gravel in it. And it's not just sand, it's sand with, is, is a conglomerate. A conglomerate means there's a lot of different stuff thrown in, like a tossed salad type of thing, like a fruit salad or something. Okay? So to get those rocks, and they know that wind doesn't blow rocks, you need water to move rocks. So they say it was stream deposited. Now, I'm going to bring you back to that. But, and then it also talks about down here that there were surging rivers. Okay? Paleo rivers, they call them, because they don't exist now. But yet, when you go to the ends of the canyons, you don't see any evidence of a waterfall, of water coming in, of anything like that, from a stream. There would, if there was any kind of a stream or a river, there should be a channel at least leading up to the edge before it goes in. It's flat, and then it falls off. What would explain flat and falling off? Well, that would have been, hmm, like a lot of water over a little bit of time. Answers in Genesis uh, has a website regarding this, talking about the Shinarump formation. And it says this, 
It covers about 100,000 square miles and generally ranges from 50 to 100 feet thick, but can be up to 350 feet thick. 100,000 square miles, and they said it was a stream? That stream knows how to get around. Or it wasn't a stream. It was a big, huge sheet of water coming off. So when would this have happened? Again, this would have been during that uh, switch from the abative phase, the sheet erosion, all of a sudden cutting channels into a, a um, dispersive phase. But most of this would have been happening during a dispersive phase. So, and can you say you drive along and you can see these vertical cliffs go right down to the bottom. And uh, some Navajos have lived in there for quite some time. They farm and raise sheep in the bottom area. This is the uh, White House ruins near sunset. And we took a tour. We showed up there one day, and uh, we went into the canyon. And this was our tour guide, Francine. She said that she, when she was a little girl, she would spend summers there at her aunt's house. And she told us about some of the adventures there. And, and sometimes, one time, a tour bus got stuck, and the people had to climb out. And uh, they had to climb a scale, like 800-foot cliff. This is the Antelope House ruins. And it's right at the base of the cliff. You can see that. If you go up to the top at Canyon del Muerto, which is the Canyon of Death, which is where this is actually located, it's part of Canyon de Chez, you can see it again from up here down the very base. And as you look at this, you say, has this cliff been existing for millions of years, dropping debris into the valley as it erodes? If so, where is the evidence of debris? When you look at this, it's very easy to see a whole lot of water just tearing through there, cutting through soft sedimentary layers, and moving all of the rock debris out of there. Because why? Because you have your biblical glasses on. Then, from Canyon de Chez, we come down, we go to Holbrook. We're getting really close to home here, folks. We know about Petrified Forest National Park. We know about the beautiful petrified rocks there. And the rock, uh, the, the tree that these rocks are made of has been cataloged as the Aracaroxalon arizonicum. Okay, well, I catch the Arizona part. And we see them laying around, and sometimes they're scattered, and sometimes we can see it looks like somebody's taken a sausage slicer and just gone boom, 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 and cut them all up like that. Sometimes they're a little more rugged piles. But one thing that's common to all of the petrified wood in this area they do not find any significant amount of bark. They find no limbs. They find no branches. And they find no roots, only root balls at the very end of some of the largest ones. So if this was a forest and it grew there and the trees fell down and got petrified, where is evidence of limbs, of branches, of roots? And I say there's a little bit of bark on some of them, but a lot of the bark has been taken off. It's like, what, would, what kind of forces would strip a tree of its limbs and its branches and its bark and then knock it down? Hmm, well, let's go back to Mount St. Helens. Remember that whole thing with Spirit Lake and all that? Some time ago, actually it was February of 2016, living in Payson, the Payson Roundup ran an article, and it, the, the headline was, It's Petrified, But It Isn't a Forest. And it talked about the fact that uh, instead, it says they washed down an ancient river before settling into the mud of a great delta. Uh, again, where, is the, where was the headwaters of this uh, river? Where was the mouth of the river? What was the, where was the river bed? Where could, could you, do, did they even bother to try to tell us what they think was the proposed route of this river? No, they just know it was a lot of water, but they don't want to say, looks like a regional catastrophic flood moved all these things around. Well, one other side benefit is we have the Painted Desert. We have the teepees, and we have these beautiful stripes, and we have these just insanely wonderful colors. When would the petrified forest have happened? Well, that would have, again, been the sheet erosional phase was bringing them in, and then it was eventually, as the, as the water levels drop and as the speed of the water moving drops, then these things drop out of solution. More sediment is still coming in on top of them from farther away, bringing more sediments to partially bury them, keep them submerged. There was a lot of silica in the water. Remember how we talked about the minute that was the dike that was formed at uh, Shiprock? A lot of silica in the water, and silica is what makes sandstone. 
but is also a hardening agent. So from Holbrook, we head over to, uh, yeah, if you want to be nostalgic. Oh, by the way, in Holbrook, have you guys eaten at the Mesa Italiana restaurant? Great food there, OK. And it even shows up on TripAdvisor. Of course, it doesn't take much to be a great restaurant in Holbrook, maybe. Anyway, and you got the teepees. OK. And then from Holbrook, we're going to head down to Heber. We're going to bypass Sholo. Sorry. You're going to go past my place at High Country Pines. And you're going to come. If you go to um, the Young Road, it turns off, goes down to Young. And then you follow it for just a couple miles. It's paved. Then it turns into gravel. Then you start to descend and go down the muggy on rim. And you come across quartzites. Quartzites. Quartzites are a metamorphosed sandstone. Sandstone is pretty soft. You can take a hammer and start whacking on it, and it'll start busting up into pieces. Quartzite is very, very hard. It is sandstone that has been taken in under heat and under pressure. The crystal and structure has been realigned, and so it's very, very, very hard. It rates up much higher in hardness than sandstone. So it can survive being transported. And if you go out on the Young Road, you start looking at that particular location, the quartzite deposits are 200 feet thick. There are 200 feet in this particular area. In other areas, it's obviously going to be thinner. But there's 200 feet thick of these rounded quartzite cobbles. Now, we don't have any plate tectonic activity. We don't have any area close by here where plates can move, where they can force heat and pressure onto a rock. The closest places to the rim up here is over by Clifton and Marinci. There are other places farther east than that. There is another spot that's south of the town of Young, but then how do you get it 2,000 feet up to the top of the rim? OK? Serious, serious forces at work. In fact, the, the, the quartzite cobbles around this area are known in geologic literature secular and creationist as the Heber quartzites. And they extend from Overgard all the way to Peach Springs. Quartzite cobbles can be found. Some of them below, but a fair share on top of the rim. OK, so then the question is, how did these quartzites, if they aren't formed in this area, if they weren't formed here and they were brought here, how were they brought here? Well, we say, well, wind obviously can't bring them. And Anasazi Indians can't bring them not 200 feet. So they must have been carried by water. So if you have uh, water at a certain depth, at a certain speed, it will pick up things and carry them along with them. So Mike Ord, who is a retired meteorologist with the Weather Service, but he's been a creation of Salt's life, he's made geology his avocation in his retirement. They said, you know what? We need to conduct an experiment. We need to do some real scientific data to see what would it take to move rocks like this. So they built a flume, put water in it, got a pump so it going so they could move it, and they put in a four-inch sphere and a six-inch bullet. Okay, So we got a four-inch basically round rock and a six-inch basically oblong rock. And they put it in and they said, how much water, how deep and how fast does this water have to flow to get rocks like this to move any, any distance? Okay, 60 miles, 100 miles, 300 miles, whatever. A four-inch sphere. OK, 30 kilometers per hour, 15 meters of depth. A 15 centimeter wide bullet, 105 kilometers, 55 meters. But we don't do metric here most of the time. So I've done the conversion for you. To move the four inch rock, you need 18 miles an hour at at least 50 feet of depth. Have you ever seen 50 feet of water out here in Sholo? And to move this slightly bigger one, slightly bigger one, it goes up exponentially. You need now 65 miles an hour current at at least 180 feet of depth. We don't get flash floods that can do that. Okay? We don't have a meandering river to bring these kind of rocks in. We don't have anything around here now that can create 200 feet thick layer of rocks like this. And these are just small rocks. If you go out there and look around, you'll see rocks that are so big you can't drop them into a five-gallon bucket. What kind of water would it take to have to move those things? I said this is a powerful example to highlight those flood. There's nothing else in history that can explain 
the transport of these rocks from wherever they came from to here, whether it was, again, whether it was 50 miles, 100 miles, 200 miles, just to even move them, you need serious, serious water. When would this have happened? Again, this would have happened during that sheet erosion, that abative phase, where you got just water just coming off in huge, thick, deep, fast currents and taking a whole lot of stuff with it. And that brings us to, come down, Mugion Rim. At least in Payson, they pronounce it Mugion. Uh, and Mugion High School in Hebrew calls it Mugion. And Mugion's like, well, but this even, even 60 miles makes a difference in pronunciation. But it was named after Don Juan Ignacio Flores Mugion. He was the Spanish governor of New Mexico from 1712 to 1715. This rim is the very southernmost edge of what's known as the Colorado Plateau. Many of us have maybe heard that used. I told you earlier about um, the lacolith, okay, and how those upper layers were soft. Well, the Mugion Rim at this, in this region, okay, is known as a monocline. What is a monocline? Monocline is where the bottom layers fault, because that's your basement rocks, your granites, the rocks that were hard from creation week. Then you have all these sedimentary layers. The fault forms, but the upper layers don't crack all the way through. They just flex and come down. And then as the water erodes back, it strips away part of it. So where the edge of the cliff is now is not where the actual faulting occurred, OK? Because they were soft and they were stripped away. So we've been around to various places up there. We've looked down, we've looked out. So you go to the literature and you look and you say, well, how much erosion has occurred since the faulting? How much of this edge of this rim has been scraped back? And depending on where the measurement is taken, the average comes up to somewhere like five miles. So as the water at the end of Noah's flood was coming off this Colorado plateau and going over like a waterfall, it would have been just carving up the edge and taking it out with it. So when you're standing on the rim and you're looking down, the fault was actually many, many miles to the south of that. And to validate that, I have some websites to show you how that works. Uh, this one is from uh, JSW Library, uh, Geographical Focal Area of the Southwest. It says that it was about um, 600 feet every million years. Happened 30 million years ago. You multiply out, you get 5,280 feet, which is about 3.41 miles. If you look at this website on the geology of Sedona, it says it moved about four miles. They just do the whole thing for you. And another website here, geocaching.com, says it was about seven miles southeast of the location there. So you take those three numbers, you put them together, you get about approximately five miles. So after this region of, of, of America was lifted up during all this turbulent coming to an end of the flood, and that water was pouring off, it was just chewing up the edge of this plateau and and just ripping the stuff away and sending it to the south. We good so far? We had a little stretch break. OK, we're almost done. We're getting really close to home, because you know by now you're saying, we're getting close to Phoenix, so we got to be getting close to being done here. Yes, we are. Taking just a look back at the rim and these different layers, I want to talk about the great unconformity. This is something else that Russ Miller will probably bring up in one of his talks. The great unconformity is the boundary between the granitic rocks that form the basement rocks, okay, and those are considered metamorphic because they were considered to have occurred from lava. And then you have all the sedimentary layers on top. So where the sedimentary layers come down and meet the granites, that is considered the great unconformity. Now what evolutionists will also say is that the difference between this layer and these other layers, that there's 250 or more million years of history missing. Something took this off, and then for 250 million years, nothing happened, and then the sedimentary layers started coming back. Now, the reason they have to add these layers in is because they have to allow enough time for all of the evolutionary biology to take place, okay? But you can see areas where the granites are covered by sedimentary rock, and in this area, there just happens to be some exposed. In fact, in Payson, for those of you who have been there, you come into town, you take a right, at the intersection there, you get on 89, and you start going up, and you come through the first roundabout, okay, and then you go to the second roundabout over by the Home Depot, and just a little ways north of that, on your right is a road cut. And that road cut 
is an example of the great unconformity. In fact, a secular geology, geology professor from Northern Arizona University says, that's a great example of the great unconformity. Where the purplish rock is on the bottom, meets the orangish rock on the top. You can go out and you can touch this area. And I like, and Russ Miller would love to say this too. Creation rocks meet judgment rocks in one spot. Another evidence of a global flood. While you're in Payson, if you're hungry for Thai food, I recommend Ayotia Thai Cafe. What's that now? Yes. They just changed owners recently, but it's still pretty good, you know. If you head south from there, because you're heading back to Phoenix, because Phoenix, you've got to get your friends back on their flight to head home, you come down to the town of Rye, and just outside of Rye, you'll see a sign that says Barnhart Trailhead. You turn off the road, you drive about two miles on a dirt road. It's a little bit rough, but not so bad. You come to the trailhead, you start hiking up into the Matazal Mountains. If, you take about, if you're walking at a fairly normal pace, you'll go about 45 minutes into the trail, and so you'd be walking pretty much to the west, and you're going to be in a kind of a groove, and there'll be hills on this side and hills on this side. As you look to the north, you're looking down and over across the little valley, and you will see lines of rock that do this, wavy rock. The implication here is that this is what it looks like on the north side. This is after about 45 minutes, you'll see this. If you look to the south, you're looking across and you're seeing big deep chevrons going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and you see these layers of rock in there. Now rocks, if they're laid down slowly over millions of years, okay, don't form zigzags, okay? If they were laid down by a flood, they would have all been stacked on each other like pancakes, but because this is a mountain and it's coming up and being pushed up, okay, there's gonna be all kinds of movements, these things are gonna start getting distorted, they're gonna get ripple and shock waves through them and they're gonna create these wonderful chevrons. And then you come to this spot on the trail, and if you look more closely, it looks like this, and to highlight it, the layers do this. They bend, but they don't break. More evidence that these rocks had to have been laid down and messed around with in a very short order. So let's go back to our original uh, statement here, assuming that the Genesis account of Noah's flood is true, what sort of physical evidence should we expect to find? Sedimentary layers of rock lay down horizontally extending for hundreds of thousands of miles, check. Little or no evidence of erosion or passage of time between the sedimentary layers, check. Erosional features on a very large scale exposing the layers, check. Fossil evidence of creatures alive at the time of the flood, we didn't really do that one, but we'll put check there anyway. All right, Psalm 104.8. I have another one on fossils anyway. If, just really quickly, it's not in the notes. We all know where um, Christopher, no, Christopher Creek. No. Yeah, Christopher Creek. Okay, you know where Christopher Creek is. Okay. There's the, if you're coming, heading west, there's, you can go in and then you can come back out. Okay. If you want to find fossils, you can either go into Christopher Creek or come to the, come to the far western end and turn and then go back out and on the, on ramp, as you're getting ready to come back on and merge onto 260, there's a road cut on the side. There's a little talus slope. You can walk up to the talus slope, and in a little layer, about so big, there are fossilized clam shells, and the clam shells are fossilized in the closed position. Now, when clams die, the first thing that happens is that muscle relaxes and the shells open up. That's how we find them on the beach, okay? To bury a clam closed like this has to be buried rapidly under you know, conditions that the clam can't escape from. And that particular layer is not very well set, cemented, and you can pick them out with a little tool or, you know, uh, something like that, a rock, a finger sometimes. And they're, most of them are about the size of a hazelnut, but you might find one close to the size of a walnut. Okay, right there in Christopher Creek. Psalm 104, verse 8. The mountains rose, the valley sank down to the place that you appointed for them. Luke 19.40, I like this one. He, being Jesus, answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. And yes, in a way, we can say that these stones, these rocks that we've been looking at today, cry out and they tell us that there was a judgment by water. As Peter says, there will be a judgment coming and we know that Jesus is our advocate in the judgment. And if we maintain a daily personal relationship with him, 
We have nothing to fear in the coming judgment. John 17, 17, Jesus was praying and he was saying to his Father, Sanctify them in the truth. Thy word is truth. Bank on it. 1 John 5, 12, He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son does not have life. Pretty much choice, one or the other. You have the Son or you don't have the Son. I said I was working on my next talk, which is very similar to this. Um, doing on uh, Utah, we have Canyonlands to explore, we have Arches to explore, we have Capitol Reef to explore, and we have uh, Bryce, of course, and then there's also Zion National Park, and one of our favorite places to go is Kodachrome Basin State Park, which is another whole, you know, that's going to be another hour plus talk as well, but hey, you got to get your friends from Payson down to Phoenix, they can get them on Sky Harbor, and they can go home, and hopefully along the way you saw a, cool, a few cool sunsets. Just to remind us again, John 12, 32, when Jesus said, And when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw everyone to myself. A personal relationship with the Creator is the most important factor, most important decision that anyone can make on their, in their life. And we build that relationship through prayer and through God's Word. So, let us all go out there and lift up Jesus. Thank you. Questions? In the back.